Well, good morning. Good morning. It's so glad uh, we're so glad to see you this morning. Um, welcome to church. We're excited that you're here. Uh, thank you for coming, and we're going to be excited for what the Lord is going to do in you and us. And uh, thank you for joining us virtually, if that's the case for you. Um, I'd like to just go ahead and get started with our prayer, and I want to jump right in because I know I know that the Lord is going to speak to us today. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we can come and gather together as a group of believers and worship you and lift you up and hear your voice speak to us through your word and through the Holy Spirit. God, I just lift up this service. Lord, I pray that everything that is done and said in this building would be of you. God, I pray that your spirit would move in a mighty, mighty way. And I expect, I expect that you are going to touch hearts this morning in a special way. We love you and we thank you for, for meeting us here and giving this um, um, time together with us in communion because that's what we were created for. We are created to be in communion with you and that's what we want to do today, Lord. And we thank you and we are wanting to worship and praise your name and um, bless us as we do that, as we lift you up. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's call upon the name of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen.
Pastor Terry comes for a moment. Good morning, everyone. In a few minutes later in the service, I'll tell you about all the things that are happening in our ministry right now, but we need to take a few minutes and pray. We need to pray for our nation. I am sure you know what happened yesterday, that a 20-year-old man from Pennsylvania attempted to assassinate... Donald Trump, the former president of the United States, and maybe the future president of the United States. Now, this is not a political conversation. This is a spiritual conversation. Because who you voted for in the past and who you will vote for in the future is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a nation that is broken, a nation that is dark and lost. I'm sure you've seen the video or the photographs where the right ear of the former president was grazed. It is not an exaggeration to say one inch would have changed our world forever. If this was an assassination instead of an attempted assassination, you and I would be waking up to a different country today. Now, you can call it politics if you want. I'm just telling you, the world would be different today if that bullet was one inch closer to his head. Again, vote for whoever God leads you to vote for. You should pray and you should vote. But we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for evil to be defeated. And we need to pray for those who know Jesus and have the light of Jesus to shine more brightly in a dark world. So would you stand with me so we can pray over our nation? If you want, raise your hands. Let's pray. Dear God, our nation needs you. Our nation has turned its back on you. Thank you for your divine protection yesterday for Mr. Trump. We pray for the lives of those who were injured, that you would bring healing to them the families of those who were killed yesterday, that you would protect them. We pray for Mr. Biden. Our nation needs leaders. No matter who's in the Oval Office, we need leaders who look to you and look to the Scriptures for truth, for courage, for righteousness. God, may we be Reflectors of Jesus, of truth, of light, of hope. God, would you bring revival to our land? Father, we just sang, you alone can save. And that is our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. Thank you very much.
keep worshiping the Lord this morning.
passage of scripture on my heart this week. And if we could pull that slide up, Marty. I'm never drawn to Revelations, but this week, Revelations has been piercing my heart with the songs that, that, um, that we're doing today. And I want to read this part <coughs> to you. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In the loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I want you guys to read this next part with me. Then I heard every creature in heaven, on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praised and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. They fell down and worshipped. This is the God that we are here today to worship. The God that is worthy of all of the praise and all of the glory. There is nothing more than him. He is all powerful, all holy. He is all righteous. He wants he lets us come into his presence, and that's what I want you to do today. We're going to sing another song, and I challenge you. Yes, I challenge you. I challenge you to take a few steps closer to his feet today. Lay your stuff down a little closer to him, and when you do, he's going to fill that part of you that you're clinging to. He will replace it with more of him. That's what I want this morning for you. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song for to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name All creation cries. 
you, Jesus. I'm in awe of you this morning, and I, I know that you are above and beyond everything I could ever imagine. Your holiness is something I cannot grasp, and your power and your, your awesomeness. There's just so much about you that I don't understand, but I'm so thankful that I get to know who you are in my own little way. I pray that you would just continue to speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you, Lord, because you are all that is good. You are all that is right. I love you and I thank you so much for this time of worship and praise and I hope that it's been pleasing to you, Lord. I love you so much, God. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Christy, for leading us today. I do want to welcome you again. We welcome, of course, those who are watching online, and we welcome all of our friends here in the room with us. It's a privilege to gather together to sing praises to the Lord. I hope if you're in the room, you received a worship guide today. It looks like this. There's a lot of information going on, as always, a lot of activities in our church, and you can find a similar information on our mobile app, which I hope you've downloaded. We do gather every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. for what we call Torah Tuesday. We study the Torah portion of the week. We gather every Wednesday evening at 6.30 with, in the summer, different kinds of activities, different things going on. We have a special guest presentation this Wednesday, but because, I should say, due to popular demand, bingo is back this Wednesday. Dinner's at 5.30, bingo 6.30, but more importantly than that, our friends Vitor and Amanda Fritas, who are our missionary partners in Brazil, are going to be here to tell us how your work, your gifts, your donations, your prayers are at work in Brazil. So that's this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And as I said, by popular demand, bingo is not only back Wednesday, it's back Thursday. I don't get it, but it's back on Thursday. Our senior adult ministry is having a brunch and bingo this Thursday, 10 o'clock, and you're invited to be a part of that. Our summer fun Wednesdays continue a week from Wednesday. We have another movie night set up for you with all the popcorn you can handle this on the 24th of July, and you're invited to be a part of that. There's a lot more going on. Our teenagers, some of them are on a mission trip this week, so we're going to continue to pray for them, and we thank you for joining with us in ministry by giving, by inviting, by serving, by praying by giving of your tithes and offerings, lots and lots of ways to give. And we thank you for being faithful and generous with your tithes and offerings. There are offering boxes in this room. And if you would like to give by cash or check, that's what those boxes are for. Many people choose to give online, and that is at firstmelissa.com. 
And especially we want to welcome you today if you were a guest with us. I mentioned the offering boxes because if you're a guest, there's a little tear-off section here in your worship guide. You can write a bit of your information there and turn it into one of those offering boxes. Or you can use that QR code in the chair in front of you. But we would love to say hello to you and welcome you personally if we haven't had a chance to do that. We also offer every time we get together to pray with you. Our prayer team will be here at the stage at the end of the service to pray over you personally if you'd like. You can write a prayer need on this tear-off slip or you can use the email address prayer at firstmelissa.com. So thank you if you're a guest for being here today. Thank you for giving your tithes and offerings if you're a part of our church family. It's a, how we do ministry together. And this morning we're going to begin a brand new teaching series together. And you've learned over the years that there's different ways to study the scriptures. On Sunday mornings, there's different ways that we study the Bible together. The two main methods are to choose a topic or to study a Bible book. You can choose a topic. Recently, we did a teaching series called A Mighty Hand, and we saw the power of God and the hand of God at work by looking at different scriptures in different places. We did a series called Story Time. We looked at the parables of Jesus from all over the Gospels. Those are examples of topics that you can study. Another way to study the scripture is to pick a Bible book and just walk through from the first verse to the last verse every line of a Bible book. We did that with the book of Daniel. It was called Resolve, the book of Nehemiah, First and Second Thessalonians, Philippians, just examples that there are multiple ways to study and multiple ways that we study together. Well, today we're going to study a Bible book, and it's called the book of Colossians. And our series is titled Walk Worthy, and you'll understand why in just a few minutes. So if you have your own copy of the Word or your Bible app, you're going to want to turn to the first chapter of Colossians. If you're in your Bible, it's about three-quarters of the way back. And let's talk about a specific Bible book a specific letter called the letter to the church in the city of Colossae, the church of the Colossians. Now, who wrote the book is the first thing. The Apostle Paul, who wrote a number of letters in your Bible that we call epistles. He wrote them from various locations to the recipients because he was, in many cases, their spiritual father. He was their mentor, and he wrote these letters because travel wasn't as easy. He couldn't pick up the telephone or the iPhone and the FaceTime. This is how he communicated. This is how he taught. Paul was in prison in Rome. The years were about 60 to 62 AD. Just for your reference, the ministry of Jesus ended when he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended to heaven around the year 30 AD. So this is 30 years or so after that. Paul is in prison, which gave him a lot of time to write. He was allowed to receive messengers or visitors when they would come visit him in prison, and they would give him a report about the churches and the ministries, and he would, in response, write letters, sometimes to answer questions, Sometimes to encourage them, sometimes to correct them. And Colossians was one of these letters that Paul wrote. He's in Rome under house arrest, but he writes a letter to the church in the city of Colossae. Now, what do we know about the city of Colossae? In the ancient world, it was called Asia Minor. Today, we would call it the country of Turkey. So most of the scriptures that we read and most of the Bible studies that we do have they're setting in the land of Israel. This one does not. It is in the country of Turkey today. And it was in a valley called the Lycus River Valley. And there were several other cities, Laodicea and Hierapolis or other cities that are nearby. And this was a city set on crossroads, on highways, which meant what? Trade, commerce. What else did it mean? People from all over that part of the world would travel to the city. Now, you don't travel to another city and trade and stay there for an hour or two and then go home. The travel's too hard and too long. You would go there and you would stay for weeks or months. Well, people would bring their different religious ideas from all over the world. And 
then they would sit down with the locals and have a conversation. Several centuries earlier, Colossae was a much bigger city than it was in the days of Paul. And at one point, near the time that Paul's writing this, there was an earthquake in the area. So this city had a mixture of people, Jews and Gentiles, and they were both under the ministry and leadership of the Apostle Paul. Now let's show you a few maps. This is a map of the ancient world. So see where the arrow is pointing, Colossae, and it's Asia Minor, as we called it in the days of the New Testament. If you see where the end of the arrow is, not the pointed end, but the square end of the arrow, that's almost to Jerusalem. So you can see where Israel is compared to where Colossae is. That's an ancient map. Here's the modern map, the country of Turkey. And there is the arrow pointing to Colossae. Now, if Paul is in prison in Rome and he wants to write a letter to his friends in these churches in these other cities, how does it get there? The answer is the mailman, the messenger takes it. Well, in both Colossians, the letter to the church of Colossae, and Ephesians, the letter to the church in Ephesus, the guy's name is Tychicus. He is the delivery man. And that's what happens. He would come and visit and take letters back from Paul to his churches. So when we read this chapter today, chapter 1, there are four chapters. Over the course of the four chapters, you're going to read a lot of names. And names are important, but if you don't recognize them, then they don't mean anything to you. So who are some of the key people? Well, obviously the author of the book, the Apostle Paul, the rabbi, the genius intellect. His traveling companion is named Timothy. He's not Paul's son, but Paul would treat him as his spiritual son, the one that he raised up in the Lord. Tychicus, we just told you about. He's the messenger. He's the mailman. Epaphras was probably the founder of the church. Some think he's in prison with Paul because Paul calls him his fellow prisoner. There's a guy named Philemon. Now, you've maybe heard that word before. You know why? Because there's a whole other Bible book that Paul wrote to that guy, Philemon. Well, Philemon lived in Colossae. And his son, Archippus, was probably the pastor of the Colossian church. And then there's another guy named Onesimus, who you read about in the book of Philemon, was a slave. And Philemon was the master. And that's what that small letter is about, how to deal with that as fellow believers. So you have a whole background now about the people and the place, and you've seen the map. Let's read the first chapter of Colossians. Remember, this is a scroll. It's not a flat piece of paper. So when you would write a letter at the, in these days in a scroll, you would put the author's name and the recipient's name at the beginning of the letter so you don't have to unroll the whole scroll to get started reading. We write our names and sign our names at the end of a letter. They would put theirs at the beginning. So it starts, Colossians 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He's about to give a greeting, but first he announces who the author is. And he calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was not one of the original 12 what we call the 12 disciples. Paul was not one of them. But Paul receives the credential of being an apostle because of his experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus. When Jesus spoke to him and changed him and called him to ministry. Apostle, the word means one who is sent. One who is sent on a mission. He calls himself an apostle by the will of God. And Timothy, our brother. These are the guys who are writing the letter. And then it says in verse 2, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. So he knows who he's writing to. And they know who he's writing to. And he writes it to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. Now, there are churches around our world and around our country who call saint this person and saint that person. And they have a credential system where they elevate people to the position of a saint. However, that's not how the New Testament does it. Saints means a holy person. 
So every person who has come to faith in Jesus, everyone whose heart has been changed, is actually a saint. It's not a higher rank. He says, I'm writing this to the holy people, the saints, and the faithful brethren who were at Colossae. And then he gives a greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Grace is charis, the Greek word that means the favor of God. And he says the word peace. Now, we're reading the New Testament, so the original language is Greek. Oftentimes we read from the Old Testament, the original language is Hebrew. And so I would have told you the word was shalom in Hebrew, but it's Greek. Irene, they're synonyms. A healthy life, a whole life. He's greeting them and offers them grace and peace from God our Father. Now, who are these people? Who are the saints? Who are the residents of Colossae? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of people there. We told you there's people who have moved or traveled from other places. There are Jews and Gentiles in the city. There are Jews and Gentiles who have come to faith in Yeshua, who follow after Jesus and are part of this church. Now, the main focus of Paul in his letter is to the Gentile, the non-Jewish Christians, but... There are both people within the congregation and both people within the city. He says in verse 3, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, when we pray, we today pray, most of us give thanks when we pray. But if we're honest and recognize most of the time we pray and we give thanks, we are giving thanks for what God has done for us. Thank you for protecting my family. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for forgiving me. We say thanks often as we should in our prayers, but oftentimes we say thanks for what God has done for us. Paul is saying thanks to God for what God has done in the lives of other people. We give thanks to God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God we pray to, because some people will say, well, we all serve the same God. We just call him different names. No. We serve the God who is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to him, praying always, praying regularly for you, verse 4, since we, that would be Paul and Timothy, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus And the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Paul says, we heard, we were given a report about your spiritual journey, and we thank God for what he's doing in your life. And we've heard about your faith, your love, and your hope. Now, if that, what you call a Trilogy, that group of three words, faith, hope, and love, if it sounds familiar, it should. It's in Romans, it's in 1 Corinthians, it's in Galatians, it's in 1 Thessalonians, it's in 1 Peter. Faith, hope, and love, they go together. Paul says, we've heard about your faith in Christ Jesus. That's upward relationship. The love which you have for all the saints, that's outward, that's horizontal. Your love for other believers. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Look on the bottom of the screen at the quote. Faith is the soul looking upward to God. Love looks outward to others. Hope looks forward to the future. Faith rests on the past work of Christ. Love works in the present. And hope anticipates the future. He says, I've heard about your faith, your love, And the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Now, gospel is an English word that's usually translated the good news. The Greek word, the original word that is translated in English as gospel is right there on the screen, euangelion which might not be a familiar Greek word, but you know the English word that comes from this, evangelism. To share the good news, to tell the story. 
So he says... We, Paul and Timothy, are so thankful to God for the work he's doing in your life, your faith, your love, and the hope, because you previously heard the good news, the true gospel story. And it says in verse 5 at the end, the gospel, verse 6 now, which has come to you, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it had been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. He says, we're so thankful that God brought someone, in this case it was Epaphras, to tell you the gospel, the good news. And it's growing, it's expanding in your life as it does in the lives of other people around the world. And that growth, that expansion is seen by bearing fruit. Now obviously agriculture, you see an apple tree, it has apples on it. Or a pear tree, okay, fruit. What is the fruit in the life of a believer? Well these are our actions, these are our deeds that honor the Lord. The godly actions that we take. So This is still a greeting. But look at the depth of the greeting. Hi, how are you? How's the family? Or we are so thankful that God is working in your life and he brought truth of the gospel to you. And that truth is growing. It's increasing. Since the first time you heard about it, it's growing and expanding. Verse 7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras. Our fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he, that's Epaphras, informed us, that's Paul and Timothy, of your love in the Spirit. So remember, it's a responsive letter. Epaphras we believe, has visited Paul in Rome, or maybe he's even imprisoned with Paul in Rome. But Epaphras is telling Paul and Timothy about what's going on over there in Colossae. And now Paul is writing a letter of encouragement saying, I heard you're doing great. Well, who did he hear it from? Epaphras. He informed us of your love in the Spirit. Agape, we've learned this Greek word, this heavenly love. So, who is the recipient? Who's the object of the love of the Colossians? Well, obviously, it starts with Jesus. But then it also goes to Paul and to Timothy. So, think of the situation. Paul's in prison, under house arrest, in a house he has to pay for. He's allowed to receive messengers and visitors. He does. One of them is Epaphras. And what do they talk about? How terrible Paul's life is, how he has to pay for his own jail. No, they talk about some people in another city. Let me tell you how they're doing, Paul. Let me tell you how they're growing. So the question is, what would others say about our spiritual lives? If person A and person B went out to dinner, would person A tell person B about you growing as a follower of Jesus? About me growing as a follower of Jesus. Would person A even have observed that? Would they even know I'm growing as a follower of Jesus so they could tell person B about it? So Epaphras is telling Paul and Timothy about the church in Colossae and how they are growing in their faith. Verse 9, for this reason... Paul said, because of the report I just got, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So again, person A is talking to person B about you or about me. And what does person B do in response? They begin to pray for us. 
But the prayer is not like some of our prayers. Dear God, please bless John today. That's a beautiful prayer. But is there a deeper prayer? Dear God, would you help Gary today? That's a beautiful prayer, but it's not a very deep prayer. Paul prays, in general term, to pray, and then he asks, different verb, that you, the object of their conversation, the person who's not even in the room, Paul asks God that they would be filled not aware of, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the first bullet at the bottom. Spiritual wisdom, the Greek word is sophia for wisdom. Spiritual wisdom is practical know-how, which comes from God. And understanding speaks of clear analysis and decision-making in applying this knowledge to various problems. See, sometimes we encounter difficulties and we don't even know what's going on. We have no idea what the problem is. However, sometimes we encounter a problem and we know exactly what the problem is. We just don't know what to do about it. That's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Okay, God, help me to understand. What happened? What happened in this relationship? What happened in the work? What happened in my my spiritual walk. What happened? Okay, now that I grasp the situation, what do I do about it in a way that honors Jesus? Paul prays that these folks in Colossae, by the way, we don't think Paul ever went to Colossae. Some of his letters were written to his personal friends that he spent a lot of time face-to-face with. We don't think he ever went to Colossae. And yet he's praying for them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I told you the name of this study series is Walk Worthy, and now you know why. Because Paul's prayer for the people of Colossae, and I think Paul's prayer for the people in Melissa, Texas, his prayer is that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects. Now, to walk, the Greek verb parapateo, doesn't just mean move your feet around. It's living your life. It's doing life. It's conducting yourself. How do you walk? And worthy is the Greek word oxios, which means suitable. Literally, it means of equal weight on a scale. So my walk, my life conduct is to be of equal weight, is to be suitable to what would please the Lord in all respects. Bearing fruit in every good work. Do you know what? is important about bearing fruit. See, you have your inside, your private, personal spiritual life. But this is about your public spiritual life. That people see that you're a kind person, a gracious person, a forgiving person, an honest person. Not just inside, but outwardly visible that you have grace or patience or love. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is what we, this is what I would pray for our congregation. That we would walk 
in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So whatever you know about Jesus today, whatever that is, I hope a year from today you know more about who Jesus is than you do today. Well, I've been walking with God for 50 years. Beautiful. You're not done yet. Well, I've only been walking with God for six months. Great. There's a lot more to go, my friend. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, that word walk that Paul uses that we say doesn't just mean move your feet, but it's how you live your life. Paul actually loves this word. He loves this idea. Look at the rest of his writings. Romans 6, walk in the newness of life. You know that thing that pastors say, we say before we baptize people? This is Romans 6, verse 4 right there. Do not walk according to the flesh. That's Romans 8. Walk by the Spirit. That's Galatians 5. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That's Ephesians 4. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. That's Philippians 3. Paul loves this idea. Because there was a tendency in the ancient world, and I think even today, there's a tendency to try to separate my spiritual life from my physical life. In other words, as long as I believe in God, I can live however I want. There's a separation. That's the, that's the temptation. And Paul says that's not truth. How you walk, how you live should be worthy of, should be equal weight to your spiritual truth. And what else does he pray for them? Verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyfully or joyously giving thanks to the Father According to his glorious, oh, who has, I'm sorry, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Look at three words that mean almost the same thing. Strength, power, and might. Why does he pray that they would have strength, power, and might? Because we just said that my outward, my walk, my fruit ought to match my spirit, and that's hard to do. Because we live in a world of temptation. So how can I match my walk with my spirit? Only if I have the strength, the power, and the might of God. Attaining of all the steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father. Not complaining, not whining, not wishing I didn't have to do this. Joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, who has made us competent to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, of the saints in heaven. Now, verse 13. For he delivered us, God the Father, rescued us, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's Yeshua, that's Jesus. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So, if you got a job transfer, you live in this city, And the company says, nope, now you live in that city. When I come to faith in Jesus, when I give my heart to Yeshua, I am transferred from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. Kingdom of darkness to kingdom of light. And how does that move? How does that transfer occur? Because we've been rescued. Because I was in the darkness and I begged for deliverance and by faith in the Messiah, my heart was changed and I was immediately transferred from the darkness to the light. I was rescued. I was redeemed. I was ransomed. God the Father rescued us from the domain of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I don't get transferred from darkness to light by my good deeds. You know why? Because they're never good enough. 
I don't get transferred from darkness to light because I study the scriptures a lot. You can know the Bible and not know God. I am transferred from darkness to light when my heart is changed by the gospel. And I am ransomed. Verse 15. Colossians 1. And he, Messiah Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him, by Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So if you ever say, I would like to know what God the Father is like, just learn about who Jesus is. He's the visible representation of the invisible. The supreme of all creation. Not that he was created, because it says, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, those are spiritual powers. That's the angelic world. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So not only is Jesus the one who created the universe in cooperation with God the Father, he is the one who sustains it. Okay, you watching? You watching? What's that called? Gravity. I was going to jump, but it wouldn't be as... (laughs) Gravity. Who is orchestrating? Who is sustaining? Who is running the universe? Our globe is 70% covered with water, which is H2O. Who's keeping the two H's with the O? Jesus is. He's not just the creator. He's the sustainer of the universe. Keep reading. Now we're in Colossians 1, verse 18. He is also the head of... Of the body. Messiah Jesus is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. See, you've heard Paul the Apostle talk about the body of Christ. All of us are a part of the body, the united body of Christ. All believers everywhere. But the body has to have a head who runs the body. And that's who Yeshua, that's who Jesus is. It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The fullness of God, the fullness of deity. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. If my sin separates me from a holy God, then that separation needs to be fixed. It needs to be reconciled. How does reconciliation happen? When my sin is forgiven, when I'm no longer apart or distant from God, but I'm close to God. How does the repair happen? Through the cross. When the sin is forgiven. Verse 21. And although you. Gentile believers in Colossae. Were formerly alienated and hostile in mind. Engaged in evil deeds. Yet he the Messiah has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. The cost of that transfer. When I am transferred from the darkness to the light. You know what the cost of that is? 
the death of Jesus. To pay the penalty for my sin. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith family or in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. What does this mean? We just said that we get transferred, we get ransomed, we get reconciled by the blood of Jesus on his death on the cross, his resurrection, power changes my heart. But that's only the beginning of my spiritual journey. It's the starting line and I'm supposed to live the next year and the next five years and the next 50 years walking with him. And so it's a valid question to ask. If I say today that I love Jesus and you meet me in 10 years and you look at me and listen to me and I have nothing of Jesus in my life, no characteristics of the Spirit of God in my life, you have a valid reason to ask, what really happened to Trey 10 years ago? Because it's supposed to remain true if it's been a life change it says continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and you say well there are times when I've I've fallen away from the Lord yes every believer has what's the difference a believer who has fallen away from the Lord will always have that tug to pull them back But the person who's never truly met the Lord, that was just something that they were interested in, a, a phase of their life, you have to say there was no truth there. Because there's no tug of God in my heart. We're almost finished with the chapter. Look at Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Remember, he's in prison for preaching the gospel. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. He's not saying that the afflictions that Jesus suffered were lacking. He says, I haven't learned enough about Jesus through afflictions. I have more to learn. 25. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, God called me to be a minister, to be a teacher, and to teach a mystery. What is a mystery? It is not something for which there is no answer. Read a mystery novel or a movie. It's a situation where you just don't know the answer yet. He says, my job as a Jew, as a rabbi, is to teach the Gentiles a mystery. And the mystery is they can know the Savior. They can know God also. Because for centuries, the Jews and the Gentiles both thought there was no way the Gentiles could know the Jewish God. He says the answer that you've been looking for is that you can become what he calls fellow heirs. Fellow believers. And then finish the last two verses. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. You think Paul's trying to make a point? Every one of you, every listener of my letter, every reader of my letter, counseling or admonishing every person, teaching every person with all wisdom so we may present every person complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which works mightily in Now, here's the question for today. Having read one chapter of his letter, how can we walk worthy? 
If that's our calling, if that's the calling of this book, how can we walk worthy? Look at the next slide. What does walk worthy look like? A God-pleasing life, bearing fruit, growing, being strengthened, and giving thanks. To walk worthy is to not only believe it on the inside, but to show it on the outside. That's bearing fruit. It's growing. Again, whatever you know and understand about Jesus today is beautiful, but you should not be in the same place a year from now. What if I go through some tough times? What if I go through some challenges? That's why you need to be strengthened. All the while giving thanks. So if that's what walk worthy looks like, here's the last question. How does it become true for me? How can we, how can you, how can I, how can we walk worthy? Well, we just read it in Colossians 1. Step one is to receive redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It makes sense. I can't walk with Jesus if I don't know Jesus. I can't walk out my faith if I don't have faith. So receive the gift of forgiveness. Receive the gift of salvation. That is step one. Step two, be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What did we learn about that verse? This is not only knowing what's going on, but what do I do about it? So we have three chapters to go. His letter's not over yet, but he started off by telling the people of Colossae, And the people of Texas. That there's a whole lot more to this Christian life than you've ever experienced before. Have you started a walk with Jesus? And are you ready to go deeper? That's our prayer. So let's pray about it. As we do pray, some of our prayer ministry folks will come right here. They'll pray with you personally if you'd like. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for this letter. Thank you for the encouragement of the Apostle Paul that we can know Jesus. We can have our hearts changed to be transferred out of the darkness to the light because of what Jesus did on the cross. And then thank you, God, that it does not stop there, but we can grow and learn and bear fruit. Father, as we prayed earlier today, would this church Be filled with people who have the light of Jesus and then show that in a dark world so that what is true about us on the inside is seen on the outside. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for being here. Blessings to you.